So okay. a very warm welcome to all of you. We are delighted uh, at CPR that we've got such an illustrious panel here today and a particularly warm welcome to Dr. Kin, uh, uh, Dr. Wafa, Mr. Salai, I think Yasmin is yet to join. And in the presence of stalwarts like uh, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia and uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay and scholars like Sri Radha, I think this will be a very, very interesting conversation. We are moving forward from our conversation last year, I think, or earlier this, this no, last year, I think, uh, about whether Myanmar 2021 then was another 1988 or was it, was it a new future? And several questions still remain uh, yet to be answered. Has civil society, uh, has the civil society space in Myanmar shrunk or are there still voices that can find traction? Uh, has the new uh, information revolution given access to voices that otherwise would not find articulation? Uh, India's own uh, sort of ambivalent role, especially with regard uh, to the Rohingya refugees and our oscillation uh, between what we consider our strategic interests and the humanitarian impulse, the democratic impulse in the region, especially when we share such a, such a long sensitive border uh, with Myanmar. All these are concerns, not just of strategic interest to India uh, or foreign policy concerns, but also wider concerns of human security and democratic articulation. And here I would like to particularly add uh, the role of women or women's groups, which are yet sort of below the ra radar, but are beginning to find some resonance. Can we sort of amplify those voices? Uh, I had a personal question, of course, in terms of the different ethnicities. Uh, which particular group has a kind of constituency that it can mobilize against the rising tide of, of authoritarianism? Is there, do they have a particular advantage? What would be that advantage and how can they leverage that? Uh, are the intersign struggles between the different ethnicities uh, finding uh, some kind of porous borders for conversations? Is the vermin hegemony losing its shrine? These are questions. Uh, particularly also questions about the extension of, uh, of Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, term in jail uh, to 75 years, even though many people consider her uh, within quotes a fallen angel. But what were the real strategic choices she had at that particular time? I personally feel that the world community judged her too harshly at that particular time. And maybe we lost an opportunity, she lost an opportunity for leverage. But I'm not an expert. There are there are more profound voices here, but I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Center for Policy Research. Look forward to a truly engaging, meaningful, insightful conversation. Hopefully what we take away from here will go into the policy corridors, especially through Ambassadors Bhatia and Mukhopadhyay. Over to you, Angshuman, um, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Gopinath. I think you set the context uh, very well and some very incisive questions there, which I'm hoping we will take up uh, in due course of this session. Um, I know we are, uh, you know, back in the era of in-person panels, in-person sessions, but given this particular topic, we had to get some critical voices who are, you know, currently based around the world. And given the practical logistical challenges, especially some challenges, which are, which are unique challenges, which are which have been triggered by the coup in the situation in Myanmar, uh, we had to resort to an online panel. So thank you everyone for making it, uh, including all the audience uh, who are watching. Uh, we are really happy to have this panel here today. I think this is a very timely discussion we are having uh, here. And I know most of us, uh, you know, already know what's happening in Myanmar, but, you know, do we really know what's happening there in terms of, do we understand the crisis, uh, you know, the nature of the crisis and the popular response to that crisis? in all its, uh, should I say, nuances and complex complexities. I think, you know, those are the questions that we are asking today. And those are the questions we are hoping to um, find some answer to uh, today. Um, you know, it has been a full 18 months um, since the military seized power in a coup in Myanmar. 
um, and when Myanmar's, should I say, like much awaited and closely watched democratic transition was uh, rather violently, almost at gunpoint, terminated. Um, and since then, a lot has happened in the country. You know, a lot has gone down in the country. A lot that has that exudes sense a sense of hopelessness and tragedy and grief, but also at the same time, uh, you know, events that give us hope, new hope and inspiration um, about sort of this collective will to create a new future or imagine a new future. Um, recently, you know, Minong Line extended the commander in chief of the military, the current military Minong Line extended the state of emergency for the third time uh, since the coup earlier this month. And in his speech, he talked about, quote unquote, the coming elections. And I'm hoping this is something that we will talk about. And he blamed, quote unquote, terrorists inside and outside the country for the current crisis in Myanmar. But anyone from Myanmar and, you know, let's not mince words here. Anyone from Myanmar, any, any keen observer of the country will tell you with confidence that, you know, this is a military that a majority of the people in the country have rejected in totality. Uh, in fact, it is, it is an institution that most consider even beyond the possibility of reform as something, you know, that must be completely done away with in order to achieve uh, genuine democracy. Now, this is something probably an undercurrent of this was always there uh, over the last few decades. But the expression, the vocalization of this feeling is the most pronounced today. Um, what we are also witnessing today in Myanmar is a truly historic, and this is me speaking and you could weigh in, it's a truly historic political experiment, you know, which aims to, in a way, drop the baggages of the past and build an inclusive federal democratic union. And when I say federal democratic union, I, I mean it with those particular, each of those terms, right? Uh, I mean, of course, this is a very ambitious mandate for a country so diverse as Myanmar, but anyone who has been following the events in February 2021 closely will know that there is a new imagination of Myanmar that is being pursued by its people with uh, great sincerity and insistence. Uh, there is also institutionalization of this new democracy, democracy movement in the form of uh, the National Unity Government or NUG, the National Unity Consultative Council, the NUCC and other bodies, the CRPH and other such bodies, as well as a military component in the form of the People's Defense Forces and other such groups uh, that, you know, should I say, aims to challenge the junta's strategic hegemony in the country. Uh, we have also seen how other countries have struggled to grapple with the situation in Myanmar, uh, especially, you know, those in the neighborhood have, I would say, largely held on to their old diplomatic playbooks to deal with the junta. But we have also seen some unprecedented responses from the region, such as those from ASEAN that, you know, sometimes even compel us to wonder whether this, the traditional thinking on how to deal with the Myanmar's, with Myanmar's uh, you know, obstinate generals has is shifting. Is there a shift in the needle? Uh, and I'm hoping Wafa will, you know, tell us more about this. Uh, we have also seen, you know, at the same time, how ASEAN's five-point consensus is actually struggling to, you know, achieve any meaningful outcomes. You know, and this is something we will also talk about. Let's also remember, you know, that the events in Myanmar are unfolding within a certain geopolitical context, uh, you know, which is marked by intensifying great power rivalries, renewed militarization in Asia's territorial and uh, maritime spaces and soaring tensions between India and China. And of course, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And, and I want us all to keep that sort of context in mind when we talk about Myanmar. Now, finally, this is something that I always talk about when discussing Myanmar. And this is perhaps because I belong to a generation that grew up uh, in the thick of an information revolution, you know, from an era where we had no access to internet to one where I think even my light bulb can be controlled by internet. So which is that a key pillar of the democratic revolution today in Myanmar. Um, and I'm calling it revolution, and this is something, a term that we can discuss later. But a key pillar of this revolution is the internet, the social media, which decisively distinguishes it from past instances of resistance against the junta in Myanmar. And it is precisely because of social media that the rest of us here and other parts of the world have been able to get real-time information on what's happening in the country. Earlier news about Myanmar used to trickle down of weeks after it actually happened. Now we are getting it minutes after it has happened. I think that is a radical transformation in how the world looks at uh, Myanmar. It is also because of social media that Myanmar's democracy, democracy activists have been able to sort of build regional and global networks of solidarity. I think that's a great thing. Um, and also pressure the junta's sort of international promoters to wear their ties. Um, I think truly in the truest sense social media has been a force multiplier for Myanmar today. But, you know, these are some of the thoughts that I wanted to leave, uh, you know, sort of set the context in a way, attempt to set the context in a way so that we have a richer discussion. 
uh, I, I thought, you know, we could do this discussion as a little bit differently how we usually do panel discussions, which is that we will begin with an initial set of speakers, um, most of whom are direct stakeholders in what's happening in Myanmar. And we have Wafa who's from the ASEAN region and will give us the ASEAN point of view in a way and also Indonesian point of view, which is crucial because Indonesia is the next upcoming ASEAN chair in, in 2023. Um, we are hoping to hear from them. And then we are hoping to engage with a very selected group of experts uh, whom I know uh, have engaged very closely with Myanmar over the years, continue to engage closely with Myanmar and who care about Myanmar, uh, most of all. Uh, I'm, I thought this could make the discussion much richer than you than what would have been usually. So the way we are going to do this is that we are going to, as I said, open with the uh, initial panelists who will have seven minutes to make their remarks. Uh, and I would, uh, you know, genuinely urge you to sort of keep it to seven minutes so that we can also come back to you later and engage in a more sort of uh, two-way dialogue. Once the initial set of speakers um, speak, we will open the floor for discussions between our discussants who are present here. Uh, whom I would urge to uh, urge them to make some brief remarks, or you may ask, take that opportunity to ask questions um, to the initial panelists. And in between those, I'm going to take, use my discretion to take questions from the audience. And this is particularly to the audience. If you're listening, you can, you can start dropping your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I promise I will take them within the confines of our time. Uh, I will keep taking the questions and keep uh, putting them, if there are specific questions to particular speakers, or if they're open questions, I will sort of intersperse our discussions with that. And you can already see, we have a very, very distinguished, you know, uh, set of speakers and discussions here. And I, I, I'm, I'm confident we're going to have a very uh, meaningful discussion. Uh, very quickly, to introduce the initial set of speakers, uh, we have Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who's currently a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research. He joined the CPR uh, in his position in June 2019 after a career in the Indian Foreign Service during which he served in various capacities in Indian embassies and missions in Mexico, Cuba, France, and the United Nations, the Ministry of Defense of India, and eventually as India's ambassador to Syria, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. Uh, he, he also reopened the Indian embassy in Kabul in November 20, 2001 as charged the affairs after the ouster of the Taliban in Afghanistan in November 2001. Uh, Ambassador Mukhavadya's current areas of interest at the center include Afghanistan and Myanmar, India's active policy and regional cooperation involving South and Southeast Asia with a focus on the Northeast of India, on which he also hopes to stimulate some policy work. His other kind of affiliations include association with the Niti Aayog's Niti Forum for the Northeast as an advisor and chair of a CII task force on economic ties with Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Then we have Dr. Kinza Win, who is the director of the Tamparipa Institute in Yangon, working on policy advocacy on communal issues, land and nationalism. He was imprisoned in July 1994 by the military junta for peacefully criticizing the regime. Amnesty International considered him a prisoner of conscience and his case was one of only two, which UNESCO issued a public appeal for a political prisoners. Dr. Kinza Win was one of the more than 200 political prisoners released from jail in Myanmar on 6 July 2005. And I think not many people know this. He's actually a dentist by training. And I've had a long personal association with him. In a way, Dr. Kinza Win is perhaps a prism for the rest of the world uh, to Myanmar. And he, has, he patiently gives so many interviews. And we really look forward to hearing from him today. Then we have Dr. Sal, uh, then we have Salai Zhao Kling who's a human rights activist who has advocated for human rights and democracy in Myanmar for the past quarter of a century. He's currently the deputy executive director of the Chin Human Rights Organization, which has special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. He has participated in UN Human Rights Council sessions, provided testimonies at the EU Parliament Subcommittee on Human Rights, the Canadian Senate, and the Australian Parliament Subcommittees. Some of his recent opinion pieces have appeared on The Diplomat, The New, the New Humanitarian, and Al Jazeera. We also have Mohammad Wafa Karisma, who's a uh, researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies of CSIS in Jakarta, Indonesia. With CSIS, he has worked on a range of research topics on the intersection between geopolitics, sovereignty, and humanitarian issues, including the security dynamics of the Indo-Pacific, the role of ASEAN in regional geopolitics and humanitarian issues, Indonesian foreign policy, the geopolitics and foreign policy drivers around the Korean Peninsula, the humanitarian situation in Myanmar, and Indonesia's maritime security. His most recent works were published in ISPI Commentary, Indonesia at Melbourne, The Diplomat, and CSI's publications. 
He has had a part-time teaching stint at, uh, in, university, uh, in Universitas Indonesia at, on units, including theories of IR and uh, international politics, as well as research stint with Bank of Bank Indonesia, where he assisted on a research assessing the possible impacts of geopolitics and socioeconomic changes to Indonesia's uh, economy. Uh, we also have Yasmin Ullah. She is yet to join us, and I hope she does. Uh, but I'll quickly introduce her. She is a Rohingya feminist, author, and poet, and a social justice activist. She was born in the northern Rakhine state of Myanmar. Her family fled to Thailand in 1995 when she was a child, and she remained a refugee until moving to Canada in 2011. Yasmin served as a president um, of, the, of the Rohingya Human Rights Network between 2018 to 20, uh, which is a non-profit group led by activists across Canada advoc advocating and raising public awareness of the Rohingya genocide. She's currently serving as a board member of Alt ASEAN Burma and of the US Campaign for Burma. She's also a member of the steering committee in Bridges MM Youth Dialogue Project. And we're looking forward to her participation. As I said, we hope she can join us. Uh, without wasting any more time, I think we will now go to the initial panelists to make the remarks. As I said, I would uh, sincerely urge you to sort of limit your initial remarks to not more than seven minutes so that we can later come back to you and also have discussions with everyone else who's present here. Uh, I think we will open with Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay. Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anshuman. Thank you for very much for organizing this event and uh, getting together these very important voices from Myanmar and the region. And I'd also like to thank you and Dr. Minakshi Gopinath for really setting out the framework and the frame for today's discussions. Very, very sharp points and, you know, uh, that both of you have raised. I don't know if it's possible to cover all of that in, you know, seven minutes, but let me give it a quick try. Uh, so, you know, well into the second year uh, of the February 2021 coup, uh, you know, what we have today is a very, uh, 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 you know, uh, undefined situation. There are really no signs that the Tamado or the Myanmar military is going to be able to enforce order and stability in major cities or across the country. Uh, even though the CDF and peaceful protests have been suppressed, uh, the armed struggle and the armed struggle is not entirely na nationwide. They are severe enough. Uh, to uh, portray a picture of continued and uh, you know prolonged instability in Myanmar. Uh, Ambassador Mukhobad, I'm so very sorry to interrupt. Do you think you can switch on your video? If that's okay. I'm sorry, I thought I did. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, in, and in fact, the struggle, even though it is sorry, not it's gone off again. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's gone off again. Okay. I'm sorry. Something is happening. Is it okay now? Yes. Right. Okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, do I continue from where I left? Please do. Please. Do. Okay. Right. So even though the country, uh, the armed struggle is not entirely nationwide, uh, there is solidarity and sympathy with it all across the region. Even if all ethnic armed organizations are not in league uh, with the PDFs in the Bama majority regions, uh, many of them are strategically or tactically supporting it. Some of the ethnic armed organizations are keeping out and trying to sort of uh, keep their links open uh, with the SAC or with the junta in order to try and get a better deal for themselves. Uh, but I think in the long run, what we are seeing is that the national institutions that are developing, the national unity government, the national uh, NUCC, uh, the PDFs, the general strike committees, the CDMs and so on, are holding together. Uh, and to some extent, they are bridging the ethnic and other communal divides that have taken place, that have, you know, uh, have accompanied Myanmar uh, through all these years. Uh, there's probably never been great solidarity amongst the victims of oppression than we have uh, today. In many ways, this is more than just a struggle for democracy, it's a struggle for freedom, in which the large majority of the Myanmar people are ranged against their own military uh, that has held power, uh, you know, one way or the other for, uh, for uh, practically uh, uh, in the aftermath of the independence since 1962. Uh, and in effect, deprived an entire generation, uh, first between 1962 and 2010, and now possibly de uh, deprive another entire generation of a future, uh, you know, free from, uh, from fear uh, and uh, in enjoying the, the civil liberties that most of us uh, do have. Um, and uh, of course, within this, uh, as far as the NUG is concerned and the NUCC is concerned, there is a federal union charter uh, and um, uh, all the parties are subscribing to it. Uh, the dangers that I think that the the NUG or the, the resistance generally faces are, I would say, basically five. One is that, you know, for the last 70 years, all the various insurgencies, the ethnic armed insurrections and, uh, you know, uprisings 
they've all been separate wars. Uh, there have been several separate wars. They've not really been able to join hands and provide a united front against the common enemy. Uh, they are trying to do that now, but uh, you know it's a question mark how far this will succeed and how far this will succeed. Uh, and even if it succeeds, how far it will be able to cohere and maintain its unity. The second is the question, the question of leadership. I think you've made a very important point about a very new and interesting experiment that is taking place in Myanmar, uh, a collective leadership. Uh, very often, you know, revolutions, as you described it like this, uh, do require a kind of a single authoritative leader who sort of pulls all the various factions and fract uh, factions together. Uh, in this case, the domineering personality of the last few years is missing and uh, does not seem likely to be freed to be able to play that role anymore. And in any case, I think there are question marks about her, even internally, let alone externally. Uh, but uh, on the whole, uh, so, so, so we have a, a situation where uh, the, the, the leadership issue is something that is being tackled, but remains open. The third is the question of national institutions. Over the last 70 years, all the national institutions have been virtually military-run, military-dominated and in fact, essentially military. And that includes administration, that includes the police, civil you know, uh, defense, national defense, and of course the military itself. Uh, if at all the military is completely overpowered, a situation that we are not sure is possible. In fact, what I did say was that it's likely to be a prolonged uh, conflict, a prolonged conflict in which may, there may not be clear winners, where there may be at the end of it, de facto states and perhaps even enclaves, uh, but, uh, uh, but a prolonged conflict, nevertheless. Uh, how do you develop the national institutions for the transition? Uh, so, you know, clearly there's a need for, a, a, for national institutions to be de developed in the course of the struggle. The fourth is the military. You know, the example of Iraq shows that we cannot completely uh, simply dissolve the military. And uh, anti-military field right now is intense and extremely strong. Uh, that, you know, at the end of it, uh, the military is required for national defense. The military should take its role as, a, you know, as part of a civilian democracy and confined to national defense issues. Uh, but the fact remains that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the resistance has to think of how not to throw the baby with the bathwater uh, uh, when finally there is some kind of resolution. And I think the most important thing, and I'll here come to uh, the, 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 the second part of the of the title, which is the uh, international and regional responses. Uh, in many ways, the resistance is fighting this uh, struggle entirely on its own. Unlike many other revolutions in the past, particularly during the Cold War, uh, when struggles for freedom or uh, even independence during the colonial struggle had the support of the international community, today the international community is entirely missing uh, in its support, apart from some rhetorical uh, and uh, to some extent, some political support. There is virtually no support for uh, the armed struggle. Um, and, uh, um, and so there is, you know, some, there is a missing factor here. In many ways, the, um, you know, the, the, the struggle for freedom in Myanmar is very much a, a lone struggle uh, without much international support. If we turn to the regional responses and in fact, even the international responses, which we cannot ignore, you know, Russia is supporting militarily, it's providing some diplomatic cover, it might even be playing its kind of Indo-Pacific card by keeping its relationship with the, with the military. Uh, China clearly is perceived to be supporting the ministry and the, the, the military, and in many ways is underpinning this entire um, uh, coup. But at the same time, it has its ties with the NLD, and uh, it is primarily looking after its strategic interests. And if these strategic interests are not met, uh, it could start making its own, uh, um, you know, deals either with several of the ethnic armed groups that it's uh, adjacent to or that kind of are uh, uh, on its borders, or even with the NLD or perhaps any of the other uh, resistance forces that it sees coming up. Uh, as far as ASEAN is concerned, I think you all know, so, sorry, let me start with the UN. The UN has pretty much outsourced this. Uh, to uh, ASEAN. And as far as ASEAN is concerned, I think it is trying, you know, heroically to try and keep its five point consensus and keep it going. But the reality is that this is highly strained. And uh, the way things are going, uh, it is quite possible that uh, the consensus may even break. And uh, there's a very interesting comment that the foreign minister of Malaysia made. He talked about, he played on the, uh, you know, on the consensus around non interference in 
Indian affairs by calling it non-indifference. Uh, that you know there is, uh, we cannot be indifferent to what is happening in uh, in uh, Myanmar as well. And in South Asia, South Asia, by and large, everybody has uh, dealt, uh, continued to deal uh, with the uh, with the SAC. Uh, India's position has been uh, right in terms of. Uh, its support for the democratic transition and its support for um, uh, for you know uh, uh, for uh, the release of political prisoners and the return to, to democracy, but it's been short. I mean, it has fallen short on condemnation and certainly not on uh, sanctions, and that is not likely to be the way that uh, India goes. But I think I have some sympathy for the position of uh, Myanmar's neighbors on this because Myanmar's neighbors uh, have to deal uh, with whoever happens to be in power at, at a given time. Uh, and India has its own reasons for doing so. Um, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I think it's very important to remember that, you know, power can come from force, but power can also come from people. And our, our real politic calculation should not only center around those who have the monopoly of force and uh, apply that force at a given point of time, but also look closely at the balance of power between those who hold military force and those who hold people power. And people power is definitely with the resistance. And so whatever uh, we as India do, uh, we should keep this long-term um, sort of goal in mind, which is that our relationship is with the people of Myanmar. Our strategic projects require the people of Myanmar. We have 2 million people of Indian descent uh, in, in Myanmar. Uh, for 50 years, uh, we did not, uh, you know, our relationship was practically forgotten. Our neighborhood relations were practically forgotten during the military period. The last 10 years have allowed it to open and flourish. Uh, I think it's in our interest to keep this relationship going. And uh, uh, overall, you know, we have a kind of civilizational relationship to which Myanmar was anchored, which we should keep. And it should definitely be part of our uh, neighborhood first policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you for raising some very important points and questions. Um, you talked about the institutions that are bridging various um, ethnic communities, the new institutions that have emerged, which are bridging various ethnic communities in Myanmar today, the NUG, NUCC. And that's something, you know, that's something, it's, it's, it's a process in flux right now and the construction. You also talked about something very profound, which is that this is more than a struggle for democracy. It's a struggle for freedom. And I think that distinct that difference between both is is very crucial to understanding what's happening in Myanmar today. That this is not a limited sort of resistance; it goes goes beyond uh, the remit remit of democracy itself. And I think this is again a difficult question that you ask the question of leadership. Whether you know we need a leadership, Myanmar needs a leadership right now, a strong, domineering personality, uh, which you said is missing right now. So that is something that a uh, question that we need to grapple and. Um, I, I'm hoping many of those questions and points will be taken up later, but uh, thank you for your remarks. And welcome to all the new discussions. Uh, Avinash, Nirupama, Dipanita, happy to, happy to have you all here. Um, quickly, we will move on to the next speaker here. Uh, Dr. Kinza Wynn, um, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you again. Um, maybe, may, okay, maybe we'll come back to you. There are some challenges, since you're based in Myanmar right now, there are some challenges regarding the internet when we completely understand that, we will come back to you. So how about we go to Salai Ling? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, this evening. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm very honored and privileged to be sharing the panel with the distinguished uh, members here. Um, <clears throat> um, I'll try to keep it very short, but I hope to have uh, more discussions during the Q&A Q sessions. Um, and I'll try to follow uh, what Ang Shuman uh, uh, provided me, the, the, the guidance. Um, so, I am with the Chin Human Rights Organization, um, uh, which has been monitoring the human rights situation uh, in Chin State and part of Western Burma for uh, the past 27 years. Um, and uh, following the coup, what we've seen um, in the state and around the region in the Northwest has been so unimaginable. There's uh, unprecedented level of uh, brutality 
and violence destructions. Um, what we did not see during uh, the previous military regimes, even at its worst uh, period. Um, so as you are aware, um, in Chin State, for example, uh, the population there uh, is only 1% of the, the total population of uh, Burma. Uh, yet, uh, the, the share of uh, destructions, deaths, uh, and violence uh, has been so great. Uh, I mean, uh, yesterday, just this week, uh, the tally came out of the destruction of uh, homes um, across uh, the country, um, where the figure is about uh, close to 30,000, of which seven to 8% uh, are happening in Chin State. So despite our small population, we have seen uh, so much uh, violence and destructions. And that has implications for, uh, certainly for India, where we have uh, the uh, over 50,000 refugees already uh, in, in Mizoram. Um, so as of yesterday, um, fightings are happening uh, close to the, cap the capital Hakka in Chin State. Um, and the Tatmaro has resorted to shelling uh, houses uh, inside the, 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 the capital itself. So the level of military presence in Chin State, although it has significantly increased uh, since the coup, uh, the military is now confined to the, the towns itself. So they are not able to operate or patrol on a regular basis, afraid of ambush and attacks. So they are basically in control of only the towns. And uh, it's significant that two of the towns has also, um, out of the nine towns in Chin State, two towns has been uh, emptied, um, Tantlang and Kampalet. Uh, Kampalet has a small number of people that's still left. Um, so the large, um, the larger part of the territory and the population is outside of the, the SAC control as of this uh, moment. Um, and the military has been trying to um, gain, regain control of the, both the population and territory. And we're seeing true uh, reinforcement um, coming into Chin State, even at the height of monsoon season, which never took place uh, traditionally. And now we're expecting a major offensive after this monsoon season. And we are extremely concerned that more refugees and more displacement uh, uh, will, will follow. Um, uh, so that has also, uh, you know, huge implication for India again. Um, and uh, I think it's an opportune time to also thank India uh, as well as uh, especially the, the Mizoram, the people of Mizoram and the state government of Mizoram for having hosted uh, the refugees and provide them provide them with uh, whatever that they have, even though Mizoram itself is struggling uh, uh, it economically since the uh, advent of the coup. Um, it's, we've been very, very grateful that we have this uh, sanctuary in, in the worst possible uh, time. We have um, on the other side, uh, the military that is uh, attacking the population at will and uh, without distinction as to whether they're civilian or resistance, um, which by the way, uh, I mean, the military sees everyone uh, as uh, potential threats. So, and the resistance itself um, is not just the people who are wielding arms or equipped with uh, weapons, it's the entire population that, are, uh, that, that is behind uh, the resistance. Uh, that's just, that is why it gives us new hope, uh, uh, even at the worst time, that the people will uh, will uh, eventually um, prevail, uh, despite all the destructions that we've seen. Um, 
So um, there was some mentions about the the possible elections that the SAC is um, uh, trying to have uh, next year, um, but uh, with the level of um, control that the, the military has in large part of the country, including Chin State and much of the Northwest region, uh, they don't have the co control of all the administrative machineries. They don't have control of territories. They don't have control over the population. So I think it would be nearly impossible um, to have any kind of preparation for any, any kind of elections. So I, I think um, uh, people's uh, apprehension about Min Aung Hai holding uh, a successful uh, uh, um, election um, should not be that much uh, um, uh, with the level of control that they have. Uh, there, there, there would be no legitimacy uh, for any kinds of uh, elections under this uh, circumstance. Um, now we understand that um, India has always been, uh, you know, careful about um, how it approaches Burma, um, and um, you know, the, the the India has tried to look its policy, look act or whatever. Uh, but this time around, I think the the the, the policy should reflect uh, the reality, which is that this military institution and um, control um, is no longer um, at the level of what uh, it's traditionally uh, expected uh, from the, the Tatmado as an institution. Um, so the, the, the policy should be uh, like Ambassador uh, Gautam just uh, said, it should be a, a long-term consideration um, short-term security interest uh, should not uh, guide India's policy uh, towards uh, Burma. And uh, I do believe that uh, instead of a look east or look at policy, there should be a far-sighted uh, policy that looks at uh, relationship, building relationship with the population. Uh, and in Burma, we aspire to a federal state um, and everyone is united around the call for federalism. And um, once we do get federalism, uh, much of the border uh, with India would have local autonomy. And that's where the relationship with the people uh, will be long lasting. And I think we should look to the future uh, for such kind of interaction and a more, uh, a more um, pe uh, people-centered approach uh, to uh, Burma. Um, having said that, um, uh, we will be seeing, unfortunately, um, situations getting uh, worse um, before uh, they get better. And I think people are um, this time around uh, prepared and also they have the inspiration and the will to fight on and, uh, and to topple the military uh, for good. Um, so I think the world and especially uh, countries around the region should um, be uh, throwing their support behind uh, the resistance movement and the people have the will to fight. And I think uh, this time around the military uh, could be um, the, uh, you know, uh, successfully toppled. So with that, uh, I'll conclude and I, I, I will look forward to more discussions uh, on specific uh, questions uh, during the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salai Ling. I think lots of substantive points there. Um, and what few points that I've taken away and very crucial to understanding uh, not just the situation inside Myanmar, but also what India should do which is that the situation in Chin state has serious implications for India and how India looks at Myanmar. Uh, in a way, it could shape, it should shape rather India's policy on Myanmar in many ways. Uh, because as you said, you know, um, which is very important and isn't very much talked about. In a federal democratic Myanmar in the future, the border regions uh, in Chin state and Sagaing and um, 
and 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 uh, contiguous areas will have autonomous uh, will have significant autonomy that's why it's prudent on india's part to make sure that they build relationships with the people of this region and invest in the people of this region uh, because the future is probably very different right so the old diplomatic playbook might not be um, effective then and what you said is very sort of crucial to understanding how the Dartmouth or the SAC looks at, you know, is approaching the whole situation, which is that the military sees everyone as a threat. You know, the line between a combatant and non-combatant is blurred in the eyes, uh, is probably non-existent in the eyes of the military uh, when they conduct military operations. And we have seen that happening over and over again across the last two decades, right? So um, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, and thanks for some of the updates regarding the shelling in Hakka and uh, surrounding areas. Um, yes. So thank you. I think we will come back to you with questions, specific questions. Uh, Dr. Kinzawin, uh, can you, oh, I've seen you have shifted. Uh, you are muted. Maybe you could unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, you can okay, hear yeah. me now? Yes, uh, I can. I think I'll remove your other account. I hope that's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. Perfect. I know well, it's so um, frustrating for you. It must be very frustrating for you to keep switching between devices. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, I think I may begin with a, a true story uh, since I have to continue from a Chin activist. Um, in the past, you know, there were many, many Chin officers and um, enlisted men in the Myanmar army. And one Chin colonel had once remarked, you know, that there is no place in the whole unit of Myanmar where Chin blood has not been spilled. And I believe that. You know? And the Chins are now repaid, you know, in what way? So this is the worst blunder that the central government and the central military can commit, all right? I will go straight to the point. When I say this, a lot of people are alarmed and they greet me with consternation. But I think that, as I've said in the summary, my writings and my notes, well, the Myanmar, I think Ambassador Gautam has alluded to this, is now a collection of fortified territories, fortified enclaves, and there is no power on earth that can bring them together, not the military, not the National League for Democracy, and least of all, not the Buddhist church. I had to say these things because time is limited, and I want my friends in India to know of this. So at least for the immediate and the medium term, we are going to see a mosaic you know, of, uh, well, the academic term is called federacies. You know? Well, um, it's not a full federation, but um, certain parts of a country can have uh, separate arrangements with the center. And that is already happening. You know the war region, which is a de facto state, as we know, and the Arakan, and now we have the Daang or the Palang. Well, 2021 was a watershed. In the past, the central Burma majority held together. Well, they were the democratic uh, majority and they were Buddhists, you know, and they shared a central um, position and a culture. I would say, most importantly, through historic times, they occupied the center of the country. And that's why this country has been able to hang on for 70 years. Well, the Union of Burma is a no-no. It hasn't worked and it never will. So we have come to a point when we have to face the situation squarely. You know, the Union of Burma as it has existed before will not hold together anymore. We have to think about a new structure and a new dispensation. So out of the blood and the turmoil of the sequel to the coup, we are having a singular chance to restructure our future anew. Well, this is almost a well, heresy. You know? People don't accept it as now. I was saying things about the 
national league for democracy and Aung San Suu Kyi decades ago. Nobody will listen. People regarded me as an enemy and attacked me. Look what happened to her, you know? And look what has happened to the country. So I'll say this again, you know, the old unit of Burma and Myanmar, which came into being together with the subcontinents in 47, 48, is no longer tenable. We've got to think about the new dispensation. And I think what I've just said, you know, in a way is jumping the gun, but in the interest of time, I will say this, um, it's much easier on the country and on the people of Myanmar if this happens. You know, I think uh, most of the authorities are not going to like it, but uh, it's going to happen. You know? Well, it's almost a fait accompli. Well, all the rest have failed, the uh, central ideologies, the religion, the uh, democratic structure, you know, they've all failed. And now we've got to start from scratch. In a way, it's best. So I think uh, for our neighbors, you know, India has um, tolerated, you know, <laughs> can I use the word tolerated for so long? Well, of course, India has its own interests, but we have a uh, long, long standing ties, you know, which nobody can deny. So I think uh, it will be best rather than uh, sticking to the junta and the relationship that is uh, based on national interests to think about the long term and what would be best for Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinzawin, for uh, some, I would say very sort of, uh, of course, incisive, of course, but also fresh perspective and radically fresh perspectives, things that probably a lot of people would have in mind, but don't have the courage rather um, to say, and I appreciate that very much of you saying that sitting in Myanmar. Um, and you talked about, I mean, you talked about something that, you know, has been brought up before, but I think the way you put it was very, uh, you know, on point, which is that in the medium term, probably we're going to see federacies or a mosaic of fortified enclaves, as you put it, um, around Myanmar. And that is very crucial to understanding where this revolution is proceeding, right? So, um, and you have insisted that the Union of Burma will not hold anymore, and there is a need to think about a new structure. Uh, probably the, thing, the current thinking, the sort of revolutionary thinking is taking shape in that direction, but I think, yes, uh, a lot of work would need to be done to, as you said, start from scratch in a way. Thank you for your remarks, and thank you for bearing with all the technical difficulties of uh, coming. Speaking. We're really Always happy. happens. Yes, it happens, and, and, and we really appreciate that you had the patience to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, there are, um, Jasmine hasn't been able to join us so far um, for some unforeseen reason. So we will go to Wafa. Wafa will give us uh, a view that a lot of us been, have been engaging with, sort of writing about, but very curious to understand a uh, perspective from the region, which is the ASEAN view. And as I said, not just the ASEAN view, we also expect you to talk about a little bit about the Indonesian view on Myanmar, and which is important because Indonesia is the next ASEAN chair. Uh, Wafa, over to you. Thank you, Anshuman. Um, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be um, in this set of uh, uh, panelists. I'm looking forward to to the discussion next. I'm also personally curious of you know India's plan and India, India's take on the on the situation. So so I'm very happy to be here. So can I ha can I share my uh, a couple of slides with you if that's okay? Um, yes, I think you would have to be made a, a co-host. Let me just do that. I think I have the superpower to do that. Oh, you can. You Great. Right. So, so these are just some short slides of the timeline of what's what's going on, and I speak on this um, uh, based from a researcher based in Jakarta, um, who who has paid attention. Uh, I think uh, from CSIS, a think tank who has paid um, quite a lot of attention to the Myanmar issues since um, uh, since the, the beginning, because uh, we talk uh, with with some of the, the the say for example, even as early as March or February twenty twenty one, we we talked about uh, we talked with. Uh, like um, activists like Dr. Sasa, um, you know the, the opposition stuff like that to 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 hear what 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 what's going on on the ground. So um, and uh, we've also been involved in, in giving recommendations to our own government and um, just just from the perspective of Jakarta, we've also felt the frustrations of of course of going through the ASEAN process of of seeking consensus and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to share you a, a timeline of. What has been what has ASEAN did right in, in, in the past 
uh, 18 months, right? So, so from, from just, just, just seeing from the first few months of, of since the coup in, in, in uh, February, 2nd February, um, some of the things that happens was, um, it was actually quite quick for the ASEAN chair Brunei at that time to, 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 to release, um, you know, a, a chairman's statement on, on the situation. At the, at the moment, it was quite weak. But 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 some uh, observers have attributed that as an achievement because it was quite quick. ASEAN tend to be quite silent when it comes to uh, a sensitive issue, right? Um, but but that time it was quite quick, even though it was weak. And 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 if you see here from from just from this timeline around February March, those are the times where um, our leaders, ASEAN leaders, phone call each other and seek consensus with one another. Uh, the Indonesian foreign minister flew to Brunei, to Singapore, to build consensus with, uh, within ASEAN and to build a position. So some of these early months, February, March, um, uh, you'll see that, that some of the uh, ASEAN initiatives, as I'll, I'll refute later, is very much centered on the leaders, right? One key, um, uh, aspect here from the Indonesian side was that was a phone call from President Widodo in, in 19 March, who phone calls the Sultan of Brunei to seek um, uh, uh, the possibility of hosting a summit, a special summit. There was some, some back then I remember there was some controversies of, as to even to how to call the summit, because you know, because the leaders are suddenly, uh, in Myanmar suddenly deposed, so how should, how, how should we call this? Is this a summit? Is this a leaders meeting? What should we call this? So even in that, sense of you know semantics there are intricacies there are political intricacies which shows the complexity of how ASEAN uh, members think and then throughout April I think uh, of course uh, as you've said um, the, the the momentous uh, moment was when the ASEAN five-point consensus was adopted in 24 April right uh, but then after that as you see I put here to, uh, after that the, the, this, the next moment that we can take notice a couple months away so August, right? There's a lot of time that ASEAN take there to, to appoint a special envoy. Because there's a lot of negotiations among themselves, among the countries in, 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 in ASEAN as to who to choose back then. So we were quite frustrated as well, because there's plenty of things to do when there's blood spilled every day on the ground on Myanmar. As a think tank, as for someone from a think tank, we, we were quite worried as to why ASEAN is taking so long about this. Some aspects of it was quite understandable, because because there's a sort of um, a debate about as to whether you choose someone who's acceptable to the junta. Back then, back then, we, there's still a belief that the junta will, you know, will sort of um, tone down their response, and 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 because that's the the, the 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 safest formula that that the, the one in power back then just 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 uh, turn its course back. So, so a special envoy that 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 um, that is uh, friendly to the junta, or a special special envoy that can actually make progress and and return democracy back. So there's that debate, you know, names from Indonesia, names from Thailand, names from I think um, uh, Brunei as well, and then they they end up with the special envoy of the chair, um, you know, um, and by that time, by uh, after the appointment and until October. There's a cancelled meeting by the special envoy. There's that's the first time that ASEAN realized that there is a lack of leverage that they have and the lack of cooperation by the military junta, while the condition continues to worsen for the people of Myanmar. Because 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 I think back then the pre the precondition was to meet Aung San Suu Kyi, but but the junta didn't give that to to the special envoy. There's there's plenty of um, reasons that they they iterated. So that's why on the 16th of October, because of that lack of ge gesture. Uh, ASEAN decides to exclude um, um, Myanmar's political representative by suggesting that, suggesting that only a non-political representative can attend ASEAN summit. So that's 2021. Um, for, for 2022, we see a lot of actions because just um, sur surprisingly, um, um, the, Cam uh, the chair, the, Cam the Cambodia is actually quite active in this. Um, some says, I don't know, legacy, legacy making by the prime minister, but 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 we were surprised because he was actually quite active. And we were also like from the democratic side, we were also initially quite worried, right? Because 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 they um, he tends to act a bit unilaterally. So there's a lack of, um, you know, communication between within the chair to the rest of the ASEAN members. So there's a worry that he goes to visit to, to Myanmar and then says or do something that might jeopardize the whole mission or might legitimate the junta, for example. But so far it's, it's, it's going, 
quite mild at least uh, for for the first um, visit. Some some others of of course believe that um, Cambodia should be allowed to try things because because you know um, quiet diplomacy, silent diplomacy is one of the key means uh, in ASEAN. So so that's that. And then we uh, I think we can we can we can discuss this later. So we have a visit of special envoys. After that, uh, one key issue here is that uh, it's being too. The, 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 the Cambodian chair is being too concentrated on humanitarian aid of things, right? So among the, 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 the articles of five point consensus, um, cessation of violence, and then the other one was facilitation of dialogue. He, he's, he, uh, the chair is too concentrated on number two, humanitarian aid. When, and that's a debate uh, uh, later on, which, which can also be discussed later. Um, so, so that's the highlight for now. After the special envoys, we wait now for, um, I think one of the latest new momentum here is after the um, uh, execution of the four activists, right? The four activists, that's that's a slight, there is a slight change of stance here from the Cambodia chair, because because I think uh, the Cambodia is also felt a bit betrayed because they were trying to work this out. They were trying to work for the junta to, 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 to make some good gesture, but 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 they were they feel sort of disrespected. So, so the, the current stance now is to, reconsider or review the five point consensus if SAC hang more political prisoners. And that will go and that will wait for the, 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 the ASEAN summit in November. So that's the, the current, um, I think the current uh, situation with, with ASEAN, awaiting leader decision at ASEAN summit on what to do. So my review here, just to start the discussion later on, ASEAN is a leader centered venture. So without the leaders, without the, the, the willingness of uh, Joko Widodo or, or, or um, uh, Malaysia's leader, Philippines leader, or, or foreign minister, we, um, ASEAN will not go anywhere. So, so, so the the the, the I think the, the low point is here. The ASEAN is still it's it remains a leader centered venture, um, and the big issue was lack of communication and consensus seeking between ASEAN leaders and FMs that carried over to 2022. In the ASEAN, the, in the Brunei term, we see that in the uh, the Cambodia term, we see that because. Because there's a lot of voices and there's a lot of opposition with regards to, to the Myanmar issue. And the main concerns for countries like Indonesia, for example, the agenda, the nature of the visit, you know, uh, whether they could jeopardize the, to, uh, the, the, the conditions of the five point consensus, whether they could um, give legitimacy to the SAC. So these things, there's a lot, plenty of questions, but a lot of times um, there's a lack of communication between the chair and the rest of the members. That's what we see in the outside. And there's also the lack of agreement in the pursuit of the five-point consensus, um, which gives me to the, uh, the next slide, right? So the ideal conditions to achieve in the original five-point consensus- oh, sorry, just we, one more minute, yes? Yes, just, so this is just a, sh a short one. So, so three conditions, and a violence, delivery, evade, and preparation for dialogue. The debate is one, that should we pursue these three all together, or should we um, precondition, uh, uh, um, Pursue one and then the rest for later, right? Because some of us think that they should be delivered as a package because they cannot go, um, 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 you know, by, one by one. Because because if you could just deliver the aid and it um, and it will, it doesn't end the violence, what well, you know, there is no no point. So that's the debate on special fire position. These are just my last notes. So there's unresolved internal political uh, logistical limitations in ASEAN. So there's a lot of um, ideas that has not been. Um, um, agreed, like the, the, the sort of mechanism to go forward. There's also, of course, the famous non-interference principle, as what has been mentioned, um, meaning that ASEAN can flirt, flirt with the idea of, because we were being too reliant on the veto of the junta, right? If the junta says no, then we don't do anything. So ASEAN is flirting with that idea. ASEAN is also too reactive rather than proactive. And there is a gap between on-ground realities, like what was said before, you know, controls of territories on the ground are, have shifted but in the minds of ASEAN decision makers, they still think that there is a controller, uh, which is the SAC, some ASEAN member, member states still think like that. So that's just my, 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 my last uh, points. On, on we, uh, the, the last point would be just, you know, waiting for the ASEAN summit, just like the ASEAN charter. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ofa. I think that was a, to begin with, that is a very useful timeline. It actually shows us um, you know, the shifts in the thinking and the, and the critical shifts in the thinking of how Myanmar should be approached. And you talked about something very crucial, which is it's very crucial to understanding how ASEAN functions as an organization also, which is that 
there is a critical lack of communication between the chair and the rest of the countries, including over the five point consensus. So I think that is that could be one of the reasons why there were so so many structures, so much of delay and stalling and foot dragging um, over Myanmar. So that is very crucial to understanding, I think, the ASEAN position. We will probably come back to you with questions and some of the questions that I also might have uh, about the ASEAN position, but thank you for now. So I think this is this is where we open up the floor uh, for discussion with our experts who are present here and discussants who are present here. Um, so I think a good way to do this would be uh, if, if you could raise your, uh, use your raise hand feature if you want to make a comment. Um, the raise hand feature, which you will see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're not able to find it for some reason, you can just make a verbal intervention and we will, um, of course, entertain your intervention. And uh, this is again for the audience who's watching us from behind the screen and we can't see. Feel free to drop your questions. We have, we already have one question from an anonymous study, which we will take up. But this is also the point where you write your questions in the Q&A box. If you have any questions which you want to specifically direct to a speaker, do so. If you have a broad question for everyone, uh, <coughs> feel free to do so. Uh, yes, all right. So, um, okay, we have uh, two panelists who have raised their hands, right? So, uh, okay, uh, Ambassador Bhatia followed by Ms. Subramaniam, right? So, Ambassador Bhatia, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh... <clears throat> uh, greatly commend uh, CPR for hosting this, uh, the whole range of experience and youth uh, scholars from Myanmar, Indonesia, India. Uh, I know that as a discussion, uh, my uh, role is uh, just to make a few comments very briefly. Yeah, perhaps uh, Anshuman, I can take three minutes or so. Sure. Uh, and in the process, raise some questions. Sure. I would like to begin with uh, a note of candor. Remember when last February the coup happened, Indian scholars as well as foreign scholars in Myanmar were divided. One group felt that the journey is out of the bottle, and this time people would prevail. And implication, therefore, was that India should now totally side the people. The other side felt confident that the military would prevail, uh, and uh, therefore it argued that a country like India should be cautious and generally stick to the dual track policy. The candor impels me to say that both sets of the scholars read things wrongly. Uh, 18 months after the coup, there is no clear cut uh, outcome of any kind. Uh, and I agree with those who say that on the ground, there is a stalemate. The military, uh, unlike in the past, uh, failed to control the situation fully. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the opposition camp has made some dent. It has made some impact, but it is nowhere near toppling or overthrowing the military. And this whole dream that some of us are building about federal, democratic federal union, we are nowhere near it. And therefore, uh, by simply repeating about this particular phrase, we are ignoring the ground realities. The opposition is divided. The ethnic armed organizations are staying away, most of them. These are the facts. We should not uh, let sentiments come into this. And therefore, the world and uh, the neighbors will have to proceed very carefully. My second point is, as our friend from Indonesia has rightly pointed out, ASEAN simply cannot go very far for the simple reason that there is no real consensus and solidarity within ASEAN. There are at least uh, four countries which are on the side of Myanmar military, Thailand, Cambodia, no matter what the special envoy keeps saying and doing, Laos, and to a degree, Vietnam. I would also include the Philippines in this camp. The ones which are really gung-ho uh, 
attacking and criticizing and opposing uh, Myanmar military for good reasons are Malaysia, Indonesia, and to a degree, Singapore. So you have a divided ASEAN, uh, which cannot hide, uh, you know, uh, the fact that five PC is fractured PC. So in that case, there is uh, also diplomatic impasse. And frankly, even if they were to secure solidarity at the ASEAN summit, and frankly, even if they were to dare to expel Myanmar from ASEAN, it won't make much of a difference as far as the political situation is concerned. Third point, I would like to take up what Meenakshi ji said. History is witness that sometimes we venerate a leader, then we bring him or her down. And then once again, revisionism comes and we look at that leader and role and say, well, she was not so bad as she has been made out to be. I think Meenakshi ji said, Aung San Suu Kyi has been judged too harshly. I agree with her. I've just uh, completed a detailed study of the role of Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar from 1988 to 2022. And I think all those of us who have been very quick to write her off need to reread what the special envoy and even senior general have been saying about her that she is no longer a factor in national drama is something I find very difficult to accept. Finally, my last point, and this is about India. India speaks through its government, but also through its civil society, media, think tanks, universities, youth, women, and other leaders. We should have only realistic expectations from the government, particularly those of us who have served in the government. We know what are the limits of power and authority of those who wield it. Therefore, I would uh, request and urge uh, our countrymen and women, and also our friends in Myanmar, to be realistic in their expectations from the government of India. But there is plenty of room and space for us to be active on to the other channel, which is the non-governmental channel. Thank you for giving me the chance. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bhatia, for your points. I think a uh, lot of food for thought and a lot of sort of points to engage with, uh, in a way. Um, so thank you for sort of firing up the discussion at this point. I think uh, we, we will we will take some of your four points and uh, engage with depth uh, in the due course of discussion. Um, we have a new discussion and very happy to see you, Sanjay Dak. Welcome, welcome to the discussion. And just to give you a quick lowdown, how we are doing this is we had an initial round of comments from the uh, initial round of speakers. And now we are engaging, we have thrown open the floor for discussion uh, and intervention by uh, the discussants present here. So if you, if you want to make a comment, uh, you, would, you could probably use the raise and feature at the bottom, or we could come to you once uh, we have exhausted the current list of speakers. Okay, so I think uh, the next speaker that we have is uh, Nirupanav Subramanian. Uh, please go. Uh, I think you are muted. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Angshuman. Uh, Ambassador Bhatia has just given me the perfect opening uh, uh, for a couple of comments that I wanted to quickly make. Uh, he spoke about how there is uh, still a scope within Indian civil society uh, for the kind of, uh, uh, to mobilize a certain opinion in, in the country. And I just wanted to say that as a journalist, I'm really amazed at how uh, Myanmar had, and the coup and the events thereafter, the actions by the military uh, across the country um, and the resistance by uh, you know, by the people's uh, defense forces uh, everywhere. All this is just, um, it's just has no coverage in India. It is just completely uh, after the coup, Myanmar has just disappeared from uh, uh, the Indian mind space, uh, the new space. 
uh, what Indians consider as news and what they want to um, read on in newspapers uh, or what they want to uh, see on television. And I think, um, you know, uh, when one of the one of the things to my mind, uh, what has happened is that uh, India's neighborhood policy has uh, become uh, very uh, secutor, securitized, if you uh, if that is a word, and some of this, uh, some of it may be justified. I mean, we live, we do live in a, a you know, dangerous neighborhood, uh, and uh, especially to the west of the country. Uh, but you know, there is, I think, now in in the sense of uh, uh, in, in people's minds, in Indian people's minds, there is a sense of siege, as if they're they're constantly under siege from um, from dangerous elements all over the neighborhood, which is the reason why, you know, this whole whole action in Chin State, which um, uh, speakers have mentioned, uh, has got such little attention. Although it is happening uh, across the border from Mizoram, so many uh, refugees, fifty thousand refugees, is almost a conspiracy of silence about it. After a couple of stories in the Indian Express, I have seen nothing, no follow-ups, nothing. And it, I think, there is a conspiracy of silence also because uh, it calls into question the fact that in, India does not have a, a a refugee policy and or a refugee uh, a proper refugee legislation, and. Um, Therefore, I think these issues have gone to the back of people's minds, and nobody is really bothered about it. And as a journalist, I am—I I thought I'd just put this here for those who are hoping that you know this is going to be um, there is going to be a civil society uh, attention to what's going on in Myanmar. I mean, you just have to uh, see how people have reacted to what is happening in uh, in Afghanistan. I don't think. There is that much concern about what is going on uh, with the people in Afghanistan as there is with, uh, you know, how Taliban have sort of started entrenching themselves and what how India should engage with the Taliban. I think those are the debates now. So similarly, those are the debates in Myanmar also, how India must engage for its own national security with, with the junta. Uh, and very few people seem to uh, care about the fact that, uh, you know, the junta hasn't really won this round uh, as it were. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nirpama. I think uh, one of the reasons, I'm very glad you mentioned this, because one of the reasons we actually envisioned this entire uh, webinar today is because we believe that Myanmar, we felt that Myanmar has fallen off the radar, it's fallen off the news cycle uh, in India, which shares a 16, more than 1600 kilometer long border with Myanmar. It's not like Myanmar is a very distant country for us. Uh, so in that sense, um, this was one of the reasons the events, as you said, events in Afghanistan and Ukraine have taken over. I'm not saying they shouldn't be covered in the media, but at, perhaps at the cost of the coverage on Myanmar in a way. So I'm uh, very happy you mentioned that. So, okay, the next speaker we have is Shirada. Please go ahead, Shirada. Uh, thanks, Anshivan. Uh, I'm going to actually just have brief, uh, brief questions more than comments. Um, a, I... You know, it, it's good to hear from all of this. But what I clearly understand is, you know, the quagma is getting more complex in uh, Myanmar. So while everybody understands why the government of India does what it does, I mean, it's called pragmatism, it's called materialism, whatever it is, uh, security is often the benchmark. But in terms of how people look at Myanmar, I'm just saying that what what is it that India could do? Because, you know, I don't think there'll be a unified voice in times to come. But at the same time, given our, you know, neighborhood first, at least many of our, even including BIMSTEC, a lot of our foreign policy outreach is impinged on way Myanmar reacts and Myanmar responds and Myanmar is part of it. So obviously it's a player that is critical in today's foreign policy outreach. But to that extent, what is it that we could do? I mean, you know, there has been suggestions that India could work with other powers. Uh, I don't know which are the other power we could work with. We've seen how US and their, you know, targeted sanctions is something that has not been that effective as one thought. Of course, there's a discussion about targeting the oil and the energy, which is something core to the junta again. Uh, I haven't heard a mention of China in this discussion. 
uh, we all know where we stand with China. But I'm just saying if that is one particular state who can have some kind of influence over uh, Myanmar, and we do, I, we are aware of the fact that they do have, is it possible to open up a conversation? Uh, I mean, I, and these are just questions because, you know, we've seen teen refugees being accepted in India even earlier. I mean, on the border at the Northeast. And I think an earlier discussion, uh, Angshuman, I remember we discussing how a Northeast leader should reach out. I mean, because they have that uh, proximity in terms of understanding what is required. I don't know at that whether there's some work going on. I'm sure there is. Uh, which we are not aware of sitting in Delhi just now. And I don't really know under, you know, because the layers are so many there and it's impossible. There is no cohesive voice that will reach out to. But for us, I mean, keeping the border safe is something primary, right? So even at the border, at the borders, the ethnic groups that we are dealing with, which we've always had interaction with, is it possible that they are conveying to us what they want from us? And also, I mean, I'm just saying this is, you know, uh, I'm aware of Ambassador Bhartia and uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay being here, that in terms of lending some tangible support, while government of India cannot do that, uh, but in terms of taking this, you know, war, rebellion, whatever, to a certain point of, uh, you know, from this fluid position to somewhere, because some tangible support, if it's lent out, I know, I'm aware it's not can't be done overtly, but at some level, it has to be done because this can't go on forever. And there is a lethargy, as uh, I think Nirpama just mentioned, that we hardly see any. It's only at some think tank academia level the discussions are on. Uh, but really, in terms of people engagement, it's only the Northeast. And I think Shonja is here. He'll probably talk about it a little bit. How the Northeast engages and how more we can do that. I'll, I'll stop here and come back if possible at the next level. Thank you, Srinath. I think very incisive questions again. I think very important questions also. We, need, we will definitely talk about these. Um, and I'm just... Uh, at this point, I'm rushing through because Avinash tells me he has to leave immediately. So, um, uh, Dr. Kundu, if I, with your permission, if I can get Avinash's question first and then he has to leave immediately and then I go to you. Is that yeah, okay? Sure, sure. Uh, no problem. No problem. Avinash, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kundu. Thank you. Thank you, Angshuman. And thank you, CPR, for having me here. The conversation that I've been kind of following over the past over an hour. It's just been fascinating and I've learned a lot. So thank you to everyone. I have one very brief comment and one question and an apology that I'll have to leave uh, for a different meeting. My comment is that, uh, you know, this idea, this this argument that uh, because there is a stalemate on the battlefield, which there is, and the battlefield has evolved also, right? The, 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 the center of gravity of where the battles actually occur have changed over a period of time over the past 18 odd months, right? Uh, the stalemate does not mean or the lack of toppling of the junta does not mean that uh, federalism as an idea if not as a as as an instituted reality politically recognized reality is not there i think i would in some ways i would echo uh, dr kinzovin's point that uh, it is already a broken union uh, you it's not a Repub it's not a federation it's not a federal republic as such but it's myanmar is not a union as its founding leaders would have envisioned it to be and this is something, you know, I'm working on a history of, of India's East. And I remember Nehru telling, um, I think, India's ambassador then in, in Rangoon, Dr. M.A. Rauf, that in 1949, March 1949, when uh, former General Nevin became part of the government, that Burma had become a modified dictatorship back then in 1949. Uh, everything that happens afterward, it's a prolonged debate about how to deal with with the civil military kind of relationship in this country. Uh, my question is completely different. And I want to you know, kind of focus a little bit also on the situation that is developing in Bangladesh. Uh, and I think that's very important, especially as far as Rakhine is concerned and, 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 the, and the situation in the Chittagong Hill tracks. Elections are coming in Bangladesh. We are seeing increasingly this forced concentration happening around the Bangladesh-Myanmar border opposite Rakhine. The clashes between the Junta and the Arakan army are absolutely unprecedented right now, as we speak. It's not been reported, definitely not in Indian media, but the kind of battles they've seen over the past three weeks, and this I can guarantee you, I mean, uh, talking to friends in Rakhine, it's act, it's quite, quite heavy. You know, the kind of weapons being used are also quite, quite, heavy, uh, quite, quite big uh, in comparison to previous battles that they've had. What if, and this is a very specific question that I'll leave you with, what if tomorrow Sheikh Hasina, under considerable domestic pressure uh, as the elections near and the protests have picked up already in, in Dhaka and elsewhere in Bangladesh, wants to use the Rohingya crisis, and I use the term use very carefully, uh, you know, to, 
exploit this Rohingya crisis and say that, okay, we want to repatriate Rohingyas. And this is one cause around which everyone in Bangladesh will rally around the flag, will rally around the Awami League, and that could perhaps garner electoral votes in a very contested and a very fragile election which are coming. And then she comes and asks India that you need to support us in this endeavor. And that means you'll have to take a call in your relationship with the Hyunta, that we believe you have been tilting in favor of Myanmar over, over the past 18 months at our cost, and we have not said much about it. What will India do? Thank you. That's a fascinating question, Avinash. And thank you for posing it. Thank you for participating. Uh, I know you have to leave, and I hope to engage with you as I have been doing for a long time. Um, take care, please. Thanks again. Uh, the next speaker we have is Dr. Sampa Kundu. Uh, Dr. Kundu, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Angshuman. And thank you. Uh, one second. Thank you, CPR, for uh, you know giving me this opportunity to be a part of this. Uh, wonderful panel on Myanmar. Uh, I have two, three points or rather questions for the panelists. The first thing is I know most of you have already spoken about the role of the United Nations and how United Nations uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, passed the bucket to the ASEAN and most of the press releases or statements from UNGA or UNSC that have been released in the past 18 months have been speaking about only quote unquote appre appreciate, appreciating you know ASEAN efforts, uh, appreciating their statements, etc. And uh, only a few days back we had UN special envoy uh, Ms. Hazer visiting Myanmar uh, uh, since the February 2021 coup. So I just want to know that uh, does this visit have any significance, any any, any real significance for the ground situation in Myanmar, especially when we know that NUG, one of the NUG leaders, he had been very outspoken about it and said that this is only a photo of opportunity and nothing else. So I just wanted to you know, uh, have an elaborate uh, discussion on this. Second point, um, uh, very recent newspaper reports from Myanmar, not newspaper, but online media reports from Myanmar indicating a signal that the uh, Tatmadaw, Myanmar Junta, they are trying to erase the memory of Sukki from the public minds, from the public memory. To what extent you think this is true and to what extent you think that this is going to happen actually? You know, uh, by, uh, uh, you know, Supreme Court ruling, the recent Supreme Court ruling that uh, her uh, residence uh, in Yangon uh, will be uh, auctioned and I don't know I mean I just saw this report so the reality of this report uh, I'm not really very sure I have I have not been following that much but if that if that is true by doing this kind of activities or you know uh, rulings to what extent you think this is going to happen uh, is it really possible to erase her memory from public minds by doing these things or for that matter, keeping her in, you know, Nepido and not in Yangon, unlike the previous uh, house arrest or detentions that we had seen in the last two decades. And the third question is uh, how the Myanmar uh, uh, military is going to, uh, I mean, what are their plans to manage their relationships with the ethnic armed groups, especially uh, with the groups uh, those who had already signed the nationwide ceasefire agreement, do they have any plan, any specific plan uh, for them who had already signed the NCA? If yes, then to what extent they are going to support this? If not, then what is going to happen in that trilateral between NLD uh, and now we also have NUG, SSE and uh, the ethnic armed uh, organizations. So I think... Uh, if we can address these two, three questions, um, that would be great. Of course, the role of India, position of India, we have already discussed. So I'm not going to uh, that discussion, that point. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kundu. I think, uh, you know, these are some questions that I myself had and wanted to discuss, uh, including um, the nature of Noeline Hazer's recent visit and the public response, because she was also criticized in the past for, heavily criticized in the past for suggesting a quote-unquote power-sharing agreement. 
Um, so we uh, and the special envoy's role remains heavily scrutinized in that sense. Uh, and the other questions. So we will take them up once we go back to the speakers. Um, the next question, the next um, intervention, I think will come from Sanjay Hazarika, Mr. Sanjay Hazarika. Sanjay, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I have to um, start by asking a very fundamental question. Can you hear me? Which is what all Zoom calls are about. Yes, we can. Loud you and can. Clear. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to have missed uh, my good friend Kinzo, uh, and I got only the last few sentences on Ambassador Bhatia, who, whose uh, work and uh, stewardship of Indian policy towards uh, Myanmar is, uh, is enduring. And uh, I was able to converse with him in Myanmar when he was ambassador some time back, some years back, Nirupama Sri Rada and yourself, Anshuman. So I'm sorry to have missed all your detailed uh, comments. But uh, I would like to pick up a little bit on what Paliwal was, Dr. Paliwal was mentioning, because I don't think you can segregate the Chin or the Myanmar uh, situation mm -hmm. uh, from the other events that are happening, happening in Myanmar, especially the Rohingyas, what he spoke, uh, mentioned about the situation in the camps in, in uh, Bangladesh, I just heard, I'm away from India right now, but I heard from a very senior UN officer yesterday that increasingly uh, the Bangladesh government is blaming the, the situation within the camps for the Mastans and all that for uh, growing violence, trafficking, and uh, essentially wanting to completely contain everybody there, like in other parts of the world where there have been uh, refugee movements as in uh, Nepal and so on. And even in India, people have merged with the local communities that they are not prepared to, to allow. And I think that um, uh, the lack of um, uh, engagement, as it were, with the other side in Myanmar, is has been really a weakness this existed earlier with uh, previous regimes even at difficult times but there doesn't seem to be that interest in keeping uh, an open door shall we shall say for conversations and this is really related also to the fact that we don't have a refugee policy we have an ad hoc policy we saw it the other day when the minister of the government said one thing in the morning and that was uh, basically overruled by the afternoon. Uh, so my own view, Anshuman, and I think she rather referred to this, my own view is that we have to look at this perception from the impact it is happening on the border areas, on the communities, the kin, shall we say, of the chins, because Communities which are on the eastern side are not going to move to the west. It is communities along the border, basically the Chins, to some degree, perhaps the Kachins, uh, who will who, who are moving and have moved to Manipur and Mizoram in large numbers. Now, the Chin movement to Mizoram is a traditional movement. It's happened over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Some of the Chins have become Mizos and Indians by way of joining political parties, joining government service, and so on. But we still don't have a policy uh, towards, towards them. And uh, I think that the critical situation that has now emerged for the refugees in uh, in uh, Mizoram especially, because they're running low on food, they're running low on cash, they're running low on support, they're running low on funds. How can uh, you know NGOs basically support, just depending on NGOs to support this large movement, uh, even though those NGOs in, in Mizoram are well organized, like the MZP and the uh, YMA uh, is really uh, impossible, unacceptable. Uh, the government of India has a, a responsibility which cannot abdicate to, uh, uh, 
to support, nurture, or at least enable the supporting of these people who are at great risk uh, if they are, if they cannot stay on in in Mizoram. And there's a limited amount to what the UNHCR can do. And that's why I think the need for uh, a national refugee law has never been more keenly felt than now, because whether you talk about the CAA situation or the NRC situation, or you talk about uh, the Chins and others who are in Mizoram and Manipur, we don't have a policy except ad hocism to deal with it. And we cannot really function like that. And so I think that the work that uh, was suggested, the idea that was suggested of a pilot refugee law way back in 2006 by Justice Bhagwati and then designed by uh, Professor Chimney and others is really, it's central that we need to keep that focus on. Now, the two other points I'd like to mention, because I'm not responding to anybody since I didn't really uh, have the opportunity of hearing them in length, is, is partly responding to what Nirupama said is, how much do we know of conditions in Mizoram and Manipur, they are dire. And I think that those of us who are journalists need to keep in touch with editors and journalists over there and feel people to understand how bad the situation and how difficult it is and what they actually want. You know, in addition to the point I've made about the, the policy and law, which may not happen, neither now it hasn't happened for decades, may not happen in the future, what is it that is required to sustain and support the people at risk? Um, and I do believe that, and I think that uh, um, Kinza may, may wish to come in on this. I do believe that uh, civil society, scholars, researchers, uh, former diplomats like Ambassador Bhatia and others uh, do need to now uh, have uh, developed a more advocacy role, a greater role in, uh, shall we say, connecting to groups which perhaps the government may not wish to uh, connect to. Uh, I think there needs to be a more of a dialogue and uh, Kinzo may suggest uh, the other people who could be involved, we can all think about that. But I think the next step of this conversation that you've started at CPR is really to take it to the next level where there is engagement with other sides. Now, one may say there is little uh, point in engaging with the junta because they only have one agenda. But I think that it is important for us to open our windows and doors to the opportunity of conversing with uh, uh, units, organizations, and and people who uh, do wish to communicate with us and engage with us. I think that is uh, perhaps one of the next steps and we should have more people uh, in our next conversation from uh, Mizoram and uh, Manipur, including uh, perhaps leaders of the refugees or representatives of the refugees as well as the civil society who are helping to take care of them. So I'll close there, Anshuman. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sanjana. Your uh, suggestions and comments are very well noted. In fact, um, interesting that you mentioned, and we at CPR are attempting to do something like that. I mean, we are still thinking about it, the modalities of it, uh, you know, uh, the core idea being to sort of connect the civil society groups in both uh, across the border and in both countries in a meaningful dialogue, in a dialogue that can lead up to something that can probably also engage um, the government here and you know we will of course all of you will receive uh, updates on as and when we do that um, so I think technically uh, we are out of time but uh, we will there, there has been a bunch of comments and questions and I think it's absolutely crucial for us to uh, discuss uh, those uh, now at the end as we end up so probably we will go back to the speakers now initial initial panelists now uh, who can probably address some of the questions and comments um, some of the questions that we've had, just to you know, refresh your memory, uh, we have had questions on how can India, whom can even India work with uh, on Myanmar? There are suggestions always, but to that uh, India should work on Myanmar with third countries, but who, who are those th third countries? 
Uh, then there were questions on, you know, the question of the always complex question of sanctions, uh, particularly in, the, in, the, in terms of sanctions uh, on uh, the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise or MOOG. Uh, will it be successful um, or not? And is that route even feasible, feasible or effective in achieving meaningful outcomes? There were also questions on, as I just discussed, Norlin Hazer's latest visit, the UN Special Envoy's latest visit, and whether it was just a photo op and she met um, in online the commander in chief. So that, and there were very interesting questions on how the, the Tatmadaw, the military, is trying to erase Aung San Suu Kyi's memory from public, for instance, by Functioning her Yangon resident um, residents, right? So, and there were questions on the Tatmadaw's plan to engage with the NCA signatory EAOs, uh, whether the Tatmadaw has any plan to do that or not. And um, also, the very fascinating question from a very specific and fascinating question from Abhinash regarding what will India do if, in the near future, Bangladesh uh, puts a diplomatic pressure on India to uh, ensure that the Rohingyas are repatriated? Uh, will the Indian government change its stance on the junta uh, in that situation? So uh, perhaps we will uh, we can go the other way around. Uh, in this case, Rafa, um, would you want to begin and address some of these questions? And I would urge you all to keep it largely brief because we are nearing the end of it. Thank you. Should I go first? Yes, please go. Right. So so there was a comment about um, I think um, I think from Ambassador Vatia about ASEAN. Um, uh, so just my short answer would be. Uh, again, I, I agree with you. ASEAN is not made for big things. It's usually made for small, small focused initiatives that can roll into something big and significant um, down the road. So I think what I see here that ASEAN needs to do is that the consensus should be pursued not for things like sanctioning or suspending, but on things like institutionalizing the role of the special envoy, you know, small things like that. So so giving it more mandate to coordinate between the many special envoys, and then maybe that can roll and turn into a more coordinated pressure, because eventually the objective is to change the sort of quo, is to change the behavior of the junta, at least. I think that's the realistic way. So just in relation to that, a comment also, also I think it could be harsh to, to, to say that uh, Madam Hazer's visit is a uh, photo op. I think just like, uh, some um, some of the other envoys, she's trying to realistically approach the situation, you know, um, to break the diplomatic impasse whatever way she can, right? Because 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 without communication with the junta, again, of course, they are they are doing all these atrocities, but without communication with them, we don't know what where 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 this this conflict fatigue will will come, right? Where will they change their mind, or where will they retreat? Where will they? stop this violence so so i think that's a, a i think again we, we should appreciate this kind of try thank you I'm sure. thank you Afa. Uh, before i move on to the next speaker uh, i would say that there are a few questions which have got you um, on i mean you know chat box uh, i'll just throw them around if anyone wants to pick them up and answer them many of these issues actually we've already discussed there's one question from an anonymous attendee and ambassador mukova that is actually directed at you which is that uh, given the geopolitical sensitivities what is the best stance that India can take right now, particularly uh, for the Myanmar national seeking protection and safety in India? Um, that is one question. There is another, it's not a question, it says, but a compliment to Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia's remarks. And my message to our colleague from the Chin, from Chin state that the resistance groups must come united and channel the resources in fighting the military than uh, writing themselves. Um, from MK Dualnam. Uh, then we have another question. Uh, why is it from an anonymous attendee? Why is India so quote unquote disengaged from with Myanmar? Isn't China's growing influence in that country cause of concern? Today's discussion tiptoed around the elephant in the room, which is China. So I'm just sort of throwing these around. Uh, if anyone wants to take them up, uh, they're, they're free, they're, they're, please feel free to. Uh, Dr. Kinsawin, would you like to make comments on the questions and the other comments that have been made? Yes, I'm sure. Thank you. Please go. Um, can you hear me? Well, I don't want to. Well, let's, yes, uh, there's an echo, so I think maybe I'll just uh, mute your other account, please. Yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, the first question is about the United Nations. Uh, the traction of the United Nations has um, decreased a lot, you know? And um, when I get questions about that, I don't want to waste too much time on that. That's being very honest about it. About Avinash's um, uh, comments on 
รักทายรักแกน I think that's a real um, well very valid you know of well Myanmar's diversity really comes out now now if I were to say so the three states and the three ethnicities who are really ahead in talking about um, well not succession but setting up a federation or setting up a more autonomous uh, entity are the Arakanese, the Wa, and uh, the Daang. You know? There are also states and in, in regions in Myanmar who are totally silent. You know? it, it has dumbfounded a lot of, lot of people. So we just have to realize that how diverse Myanmar is. Well, if that happens in Rakhine, it's really something. Now, this is just between ourselves. I've met a Bangladeshi diplomat who says that we don't want to uh, subvert Myanmar. Now, within a couple of days, we can arm 20,000 Rohingyas, but we won't do that. And I believe him. You know? Bangladesh is, you know, I think Bangladesh's intellectual capacity is much more than what we have in Navy Dog. And you can quote me, right? So that is something that we all have to think about and what is India going to do in that part of the country and in the region, Bangladesh has got a direct border with Rakhine, which could become autonomous or sovereign or whatever. And um, thirdly, what Sanjoy has said, uh, I think um, as the neighboring democracy and a middle power, India will have to engage more. Now, I'm very sad to say that the Indian mission in Yangon is not doing that. You know, when Gautam was there, he met everybody. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not happening now. Now, I think it's very urgent that India has to reach out. And uh, I was in Chiang Mai last month together with Gautam uh, at a very interesting conference. Lots of people attended. Uh, it doesn't cost much, but you meet a very wide range of people who are very much engaged with, with the situation in Myanmar. I think um, India can easily do that as a um, um, track two or track one and a half. And I don't think it'll hurt um, normal bilateral relations. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ginza Win. Um, okay. Uh, the next speaker, I think, would probably go to Salai Ling. Uh, Salai Ling, maybe you could take some of the questions uh, regarding the Tatmadaw's uh, so-called plans to engage with the NCA signatories and how their entire sort of landscape uh, is is panning out. And you could also take any other comments or questions that you wish to. Please go ahead, Salai Ling. Well, um, I think that Tatmadaw's engagement with the NCA signatory, signatories is um, based on a willingness to gain legitimacy and um but a lot of groups within the the groups uh that have signed the nca realized that and uh that's why we've seen from the very um beginning uh of the coup that some groups have uh openly tried to distance themselves and uh in the case of the chin you know, as soon as the uh, the coup happened, um, they withdrew. Um, I mean, from any kind of contact with the the SAC, and also, even though they have been engaging with the other groups, um, you know, they are the first one. For example, the CNF was the first uh, uh, EAO to be, you know, openly supporting. Uh, and UG. Um, and I, I think um, uh, depending on uh, who the group is, I mean, uh, obviously they, they do have, um, uh, they, they do have their own uh, interest at play, but I think uh, the SAC will continue to seek legitimacy through engagement with these, these some of these groups, uh, but 
over time, I think um, uh, if there's no uh, significant progress, um, I, I think th there will be less and less uh, fewer uh, groups willing to be used as a as a PR, um, you know, uh, thing for the uh, NIPIDO, you know, just shaking hand, and they have their own public uh, to think about also. Uh, I think some of these groups are also facing public pressure. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, we've seen in uh, Rakhine the, 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 the search in violence again uh, with the, um, um, the, the new fighting with AA. I think it's indicative of um, how the Tatmadaw is being viewed by some of these groups who have, uh, you know, uh, taken a, a rather idle role uh, up to this point. But uh, I think the, the, the trajectory though is that uh, we'll be seeing a withdrawal uh, from uh, more of these groups uh, with, uh, uh, in terms of engagement with the SAC. Thank you, Hassan Ailing. I think the Arakan Army question remains an increasingly complex one. and. A lot of the dynamics around Northwest Western Myanmar will be shaped by how that, that pans out. Um, so thank you for your comments. Uh, Ambassador Mukhobadhyay, please go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Anshuman. Thank you for steering this discussion very capably and uh, also for the many, um, you know, to the panelists, uh, to the uh, people who pose questions, to the experts uh, for their many thought-provoking questions. Uh, Anshuman, I'm sort of tempted to answer several of them. So I don't know if I have the time and uh, may I have your indulgence to do that. Sure, please go ahead. So let me just start, I think, with this, uh, uh, with one sort of uh, question that I think uh, covers a lot of ground and a set of questions that cover a lot of ground. One is uh, Mr. Wafa himself asked about, you know, what does India think, uh, what does, what can India do uh, in terms of either taking leadership or working jointly? And this question came up from others also working jointly with others. You know, I've always maintained that, in fact, uh, within the ASEAN group, you have three or four countries that share borders uh, with, uh, with Myanmar. But there are three other major countries that also share borders with Myanmar that are actually completely left out of any kind of formal process, uh, particularly since the UN is not involved. And that's China, India, and Bangladesh. Uh, I think, in fact, if we want to keep ASEAN centrality, um, uh, Mr. Wafa himself mentioned that, and I agree that I don't think this ASEAN initiative is likely to go very far. Uh, we are coming to, you know, we are reaching a situation where almost everything that we have talked about is bankrupt, and we really need to think uh, anew. I mean, even the sort of questions that, uh, you know, the kind of tricks that the Tamado is trying to do right now, talk, you know, talking to the ethnic armed organizations, trying to hold elections uh, next year, these are all from the from an old playbook, they're no longer going to work. The situation in Myanmar today is radically new, and we really need to look at it with very fresh kind of eyes and lenses. And one of the things that I would say in terms of what India or perhaps the region can do is to bring all the countries that share borders with Myanmar and who are directly affected and who have stakes in Myanmar, and it's precisely those stakes that actually prevent them from taking stronger positions uh, to actually get into a dialogue. And this would ideally be done uh, by the ASEAN taking an initiative by in, and inviting uh, the, the neighbors into, and at least it would preserve ASEAN-led and ASEAN centrality uh, to be able to do that rather than all these countries negotiating and making deals or whatever with the, the Myanmar junta on its own. Already, you know that China has that kind of network which is able to operate uh, bilaterally. The question of uh, China also came up. I would very clearly say that it's in our interest today. China is deeply associated, rightly or wrongly, with the Myanmar coup and is deeply unpopular. In fact, I don't think any purpose is served by imitating China light uh, on Myanmar. It is far better to take an alternative strategy and be much more pro-people and get the political capital that you can get out of, get out of it. Another question that was asked is, what can India do? You know, what can India can do a lot short of uh, forget armed intervention, short of, you know, any kind of even humanitarian intervention. Uh, India can provide, um, Sanjoy talked about, uh, you know, people at risk. 
India can provide scholarships to a number to all the youth who have been forced out of uh, Myanmar, just as we did to uh, Afghan students during the period of the Islamic Republic. We can host scholars at risk at our think tanks if we wish to. Uh, Chiang Mai University, which uh, um, Kinzovin referred to, is already doing that. Uh, there are people willing to support that kind of program. Uh, there are n number of things that you can do in terms of just being able to provide uh, platforms for refugees. Um, you know, uh, Sanjoy talked about a new refugee policy. You know, the interesting thing is that India, without a refugee policy, has so far had a, had a compassionate uh, kind of attitude towards refugees. The demand for a refugee policy actually is coming from those people who want to restrict uh, uh, refugees. And so I don't know if today is the right political climate for a refugee policy. We are already seeing that the CAA was actually a step in that direction. And it would clearly exclude certain categories of people. Uh, we know that the Ministry of Home Affairs was extremely hesitant to allow even the, uh, the, the number of refugees that uh, that Mizoram has accepted. And that has only been possible because the chief minister of Mizoram took a very activist position and was eventually able to, uh, to create a kind of modus vivendi uh, with the center that they would accept the refugees provided uh, the, the, the home ministry didn't really have to take the burden uh, on it. So I agree that it's unconscionable that uh, Mizoram government and Mizoram civil society has to bear this burden, but at least that is better than a complete, than a than a strategy of uh, turning them back. Uh, so I would say that, you know, we may hope that a refugee policy will be compassionate, but at this point of time, I'm not so sure it will go in that direction, given the kind of uh, uh, anti-refugee sentiment that there is, uh, uh, you know, in, in certain quarters uh, in India. Very interesting questions posed by, um, by Avinash, you know, on what could happen there. All the more reason that Bangladesh has to be part of the solution and not be left out. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the, they are carrying a big burden. Uh, I think, in fact, on the question of refugees, it's very clear that if there is any return, it can only be if there is a, a federal democratic union, not the current conditions. Current conditions are not conducive to the return of refugees. Uh, so, in fact, we have to see a resolution to that crisis. And in the meantime, you know, we may have to think of the unthinkable, uh, which is uh, um, relocation in third countries. I mean, I think the, the kind of situation that uh, Bangladesh is confronted with is, uh, is simply, uh, you know, unacceptable. I mean, it's untenable. Uh, you cannot confine a million people in refugee camps, uh, not allowed to work, uh, you know, not being able to do anything. Now, the time has come to think of, you know, what, uh, what is, you know, what are really the unthinkable kind of solutions. So I'll end you know, with a quick little remark on Ambassador Bhatia's uh, sort of observations. I think Ambassador Bhatia gave us a way, but also I think many arguments for the government to remain where it is and not do anything. And actually, let's say, transfer the responsibility for uh, relationship with the uh, opposition or the civil society in Myanmar to the civil society and opposition in India. I come back to this whole question. You know, this is not 1988. Uh, this is a completely new situation and we really need new ways of looking at it. Um, I do not think that the military will be able to prevail and reestablish the kind of order uh, that uh, it was able to do in the 1990s. Uh, uh, I don't think the military today has the imagination, even the political imagination to do so. Uh, positions are totally polarized. I mean, the opposition wants to have no truck with the military, and you can see that in reactions to Noelin Hazer's visit. And the military is also incapable of compromise. Uh, you have a situation where, you know, really there is very little scope for, for diplomacy. And yet, you know, there is very little international support either. So, as I said, this is a, this is a battle that the Myanmar uh, uh, people will have to fight by and large by themselves, but at least the neighbors and the international community can do something to ameliorate and mitigate conditions and think fresh. Uh, uh, old ideas are not going to work anymore, and it's really, really important that uh, we think, uh, you know, radically fresh on on Myanmar. Thank you, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, for your very, I would say, clear, clear-headed sort of sides on on the issue.
um, we are well over time, but uh, I see Ambassador Bhatia and Sanjana have raised their hand. So, uh, Ambassador Bhatia, I will go to uh, both speakers, uh, but since urge them to keep your comments brief because, as I said, we are well over time. Ambassador Bhatia, please go. Ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I appreciate. I know that I am not a panelist, but uh, let me assure you, I shall continue my dialogue with my dear friend and colleague Gautam separately. So I shall not uh, take time of yours here. Uh, I want to answer uh, Avinash's uh, question. I think uh, he is gone, but he is talking in a diplomat's tongue and I understand what he's saying. He is not saying that when Begum Azina comes, uh, she would ask for diplomatic support of India that they have been doing for past five years. To my mind, what Avinash is implying is what happens if Begum Asina asks India for military support to ensure that the refugees go back to Myanmar. My answer is, Prime Minister Modi will say, Madam, next question. <laughs> Second point, uh, Sri Radhaji's, uh, uh, you know, suggestion, uh, a truly academic suggestion can be collaborate with China to resolve the Myanmar problem. I'm afraid, Madam, it is not possible given the present uh, uh, state of India-China relations. Please uh, do not divorce yourself from reality so much that you begin to hope that your competitor and your adversary in that country, namely China, will cooperate with you to resolve the Myanmar problem. And my last uh, point very briefly is uh, indeed about ASEAN. If you know this idea that ASEAN should invite the neighbors to discuss uh, a resolution of Myanmar problem, I can assure you the neighbors uh, will end up, uh, you know, uh, putting their weight more for the status quo than for some radical change named uh, uh, Federal Democratic Union. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Badia. Thank you for your comments. Uh, sorry, Sanjada, please go ahead. Uh, Sanjada, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just trying to sure. get this to work. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, um, I want to agree, uh, first of all, with, and I have two comments, really. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank Gautam for his points. On the refugee law, you know, the refugee law which is being developed now, the form of refugee law that is being developed is through the CAA process. It's not really developed any other way, but I'm just saying that I acknowledge I'm realistic enough to know that this is most unlikely the uh, a model refugee law or the refugee law of any kind, but it's one thing that makes sense. Even even in these uh, dire circumstances, so we we basically have to keep at it. The the second thing which I want to uh, mention was that um, in these in these conditions, it's really important, as everybody has said, to keep the conversations going with all sides, with other scholars, with. Uh, uh, people from the opposition in the uh, uh, in the Myanmar uh, situation, uh, and also reach out to our friends and, and colleagues in Manipur and Mizoram who are really trying to their best to uh, uh, to help in this extremely difficult and critical situation. Uh, so those are basically uh, my points. I mean, I, I really don't have anything more, but. I think the dialogue needs to continue and and be uh, deeper and, and sharper and broader. Uh, so thank you for giving me the chance and uh, I look forward to the next next round and uh, meeting in person on this. Thank you, Sanjana, likewise. And the, as you said, the dialogue must go on and the dialogue will go on. And when we talk about Myanmar, when you arrange a dialogue on Myanmar, you know, there are... Uh, 
it always very it always automatically becomes very ambitious because you've got to bring so many voices together there are so many different stakeholders there are so many different uh, different and often contrasting sort of aspirations ethnic and political aspirations um, so it's always a, always a very ambitious mandate to arrange something around myanmar but i think we have um, done a fairly sort of good job today of initiating that kind of discussion i wouldn't say this is the first of course uh, others have discussed myanmar but as nirupama had mentioned here you know myanmar has sort of fallen off the map and i hope it doesn't happen uh, it's a reality unfortunate reality but it has happened but i think one two things rather that we have sort of understood here that to, from the discussion today is that there are certain truisms some realities and facts uh, which make it seem like things are intractable at the moment that things cannot move uh head but at the same time i think there is across the board consensus there is that there is almost across the board consensus that, that there is a need for fresh thinking and to put it simply there is a need to uh dream you know a dream of a new reality uh because the people of myanmar people i know very closely in myanmar um are dreaming about that new reality are imagining that new reality so as sort of outsiders sitting outside and talking about myanmar i think that is uh, the very need to share that imagination at least Uh, to the very least we can do uh, in that sense, and to that end, as there were several suggest suggestions here that were given, very pertinent suggestions, and we are going to, uh, at least I'm going to save this chat here because there are some very prudent suggestions and practical suggestions for Dr. Uh, Win and Salai Ling on what can be done, including some probably track dialogues in a neutral venue like Thailand. and so certain assistance channels for refugees that could be open. And as I said earlier, CPR we are. trying to do more to connect the civil societies from Myanmar and India uh, to offset perhaps for the diplomatic passivity in a way uh, to make sure that the conversation goes on and the conversation goes on in meaningful and you know conversations that lead to meaningful solidarities and not just vacuous abstract conversations um in that sense uh, dr gopinath i would just quickly hand over to you for probably a quick word of thanks and on behalf of cpr and then probably i i can come back and end the session thank you this has been a, a fascinating discussion and it's also been a great eye opener um i want to thank all the speakers here and i want to add uh to what ankshman has said we at cpr are beginning a series of conversations um on this uh, you know sort of with uh, gautam and ankshman in the lead and we hope to see the unfolding of several such interactions uh the i i take very seriously the comments made by ambassador bhatia as always and nirupama who have said that we need to amplify the other voices and that is precisely what we attempt to do here at cpr uh, uh mr kinso wins idea of the mosaic the mosaic perspective is particularly interesting in this regard and starting a new the sense i get is that right now myanmar is a typical example of a bonaparte state which stands as a sort of an excrescence above above society cut from its sort of life blood in a way to bankrupt to continue yet the other forces have not yet found the assertive uh, space to take over so it is in that twilight zone so what does this mosaic idea do for us when we are looking at starting a fresh um the other issue is about of course the elephant in the room and and china's looming presence and a realistic appreciation of what are really the indian state's strategic options since china always keeps all its options open even as it cozies up to the junta it's also keeping some channels of communication with the uh, with the some of the ethnic groups um i i i'm i'm afraid i will have to agree with gautam on this issue of whether this is the appropriate time to look at a refugee formal refugee policy because even on non rafulma we have been sort of uh, moving more in the direction of the caa spirit and it's we are not likely to see a more expansive and humanitarian uh, refugee policy but it's important for us i think to recognize that here are two very diverse countries which speaks in different voices as ambassador bhatia said and that diversity is what will enable us to connect probably better the state of the camps as we know well in bangladesh is where the state of exception prevails 
uh, with a new impunity. There's a new ASAP's report on it about uh, the horrendous state of the camps. I am not very sanguine about Sheikh Hasina's appeal and what is likely to happen <laughs> in the Bangladesh elections, but that is going to be also a very, uh, shall I say, slippery slope. Uh, and I think the whole idea of providing a safe uh, space for voices to come in, to push the conversation forward, to also represent what's going on today in Burma to Indian civil society, because there is a great deal of both ignorance and confusion, despite uh, people like uh, Ambassador Bhatia, uh, uh, Ambassador Mukhopadhyay, and of course Nirupama's very spirited writings. Uh, I think there is a need for us to clear the air about the diversities and whether the diversities give us opportunities or do they close them. I believe I think it's important to engage with the realm of possibility to rewrite the scripts on this particular very, very difficult issue of civil military uh, relations uh, and look at disaggregating, in a sense, the state from the other voices that can prevail even today from within India. So thank you. We look forward to many more dialogues and your cooperation to push this program forward uh, at CPR. And uh, we are really grateful for your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopinath, for your guidance and support as always. And once again, thank you everyone for coming. I think, as I said, we have had a, a very thought-provoking discussions. I am personally going back um, with a lot in mind to think about. Uh, some Myanmar is always a complex issue to address. It's a very difficult question to answer in a way. And it is still a question uh, yeah, in many ways. So uh, thank you once again for coming. I would also like to specially thank Prakriti from our communications team, who you can't see here, but she's there. She's been instrumental, absolutely instrumental to organizing this, uh, you know, virtual panel, large, fairly large virtual panel. It can be cumbersome um, at times uh, in terms of communication and coordinating with players, and she has been very helpful. So Prakriti, thank you very much for coordinating this. Um, thank you. Making this such a great success. Once again, thank you all. We hope to stay in touch with all of you and engage in meaningful ways. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, take care. Good night, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.